Once again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. I'm delighted to worship with you and uh, enjoy a Sabbath day with my family and my in-laws as well. So thank you for the hospitality. The Winter Olympics just passed. And I don't know how many of you were able to see at least a little bit of the Olympics, but um, it was fun to see uh, a little bit of those and uh, to see how some of those individuals have to train, obviously, for years before showing up to the Olympics. And just this uh, summer, we will have uh, the World Cup in Brazil. I don't know how many soccer fans are here, but here in front, you have one. And uh, I know that uh, that will come up in, in uh, June, in the summer, world soccer. And uh, it'll be, uh, there's a number of preparations for the World Cup just as well for the Olympics. For example, uh, they need to choose the players, the best players. Number two, they need to choose the best uh, coach. And number three, they need to start training uh, and after that, uh, probably they can say that they will be ready. But you know what? Come in June, it will be ridiculous if a team says they go to Brazil for the World Cup and they said, oh, you know what? We're, we're, we're not ready. Can you delay the World Cup two more months? Of course, that's not going to happen because um, either you're ready or you are Not. Something similar happened with our readiness toward the second coming of Christ. There is, there is a time to get ready, and there is a time to be ready. And even though there is not a moment when we can selfishly say, I am ready, this is it, I'm ready. But for sure we can move in the direction of being ready. One thing, my fellow brothers and sisters, is to know about the second coming of Christ and have the, the knowledge of it. And another is to say, I believe in the second coming of Christ. Uh, one thing is to say, uh, one thing is to say, I believe, and quite another is to leave in expectation of the coming moment when the Lord is going to come. One thing is to be alarmed by the second coming of Christ or perhaps fear the second coming of Christ. And another is to expect the second coming of Christ because we love his coming and we can't wait for his coming. My wife is from Romania, and we, when we first started dating, she was there, I was here. And I remember those days when we needed, she needed to come, and we, needed, we had a date to get married in the Battle Creek Tabernacle, and she could not come because uh, when she went to the embassy, she didn't get the visa. And we had a date for the wedding. It was a summer in a July and uh, we had to completely cancel everything, send all our uh, uh, notes of cancellation. And we didn't have a date anymore, a date to get married. And finally, the Lord opened the doors through a congressman, and she, and, and she was able to get an uh, appointment at the embassy. And again, uh, uh, presented herself to the embassy there in Romania. She was able to get a visa. And now I had two months to get ready all of, the, all of the wedding arrangements. By the way, in case you need a wedding coordinator here, you have one. I have coordinated two of my own weddings with the same, with the same wife. <laughs> so to redo the whole thing again. But when she was coming from Romania, two months, and then I was counting in that calendar, 30 days, 20 days, 10 days, 9, and I have a big calendar every day that passed. I had an X, and I wonder, and I wonder if we shouldn't have something similar regarding the second coming of Christ. I can't wait. <coughs> Excuse me. 
that attitude of I can't wait for him to come. So the question that we ask today, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I got too emotional about the story with my wife. <laughs> now I can't talk. How do we determine, is the question, how do we determine if we are truly ready, interested, and anticipating and preparing for the second coming? How do we know? Let me share with you a few texts in the Bible, a few ways in the Bible on how we can know at least if we're heading into the right, in the right direction. First of all, <clears throat> we need to determine if we're dead or, or alive. Pastor Ortiz, but I have been attending the Seventh-day Adventist Church for 30 years, and you're asking me if I'm dead or, or alive? Yeah. Because we may be alive physically, but dead spiritually and in our hopes for the second coming. Harvard biologist Edward Wilson made a very interesting uh, discovery. Edward Wilson, Dr. Wilson, is an expert in insects. Actually, he's one of the most, uh, uh, thank you so much, expert uh, individuals in the world in terms of insects. And he has a three-inch book just on ants. Imagine how much can you learn in ants. Well, yeah, there is a lot that we can learn from ants. And he, he made a huge study on ants, and he realized that uh, ants have a cemetery of sorts. When, a, when, a, when one of the ants die, they take the ant, and they will bring that ant to a cemetery of Sorts. They have a pile, if you please, of ants. But he realized that they will not take the ant away from the nest until the ant is really, really dead, and they need to certify that the ant is dead. How do they certify that the ant is dead? When the ant is really dead, after uh, perhaps a few days of being there, uh, uh, you know, the ants want to make sure that the ant is not taking a nap or something. So they want to make sure that he's dead. Um, and uh, so after that, after a few days, the ant starts secreting uh, 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 an acid that is called oleic acid. And at that time, they say, oh, okay, this ant is dead. Take the ant away and put it in the cemetery of sorts. So uh, Dr. Wilson made something interesting. I could have never thought of doing this. He grabbed a, a dropper, and he dropped an a, a, a drop of oleic acid on the ant, on one, on one very healthy ant, very alive ant in the nest. And immediately, what do you think the ants did? They came, they carry the, 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 the very much alive ant on their back, and they took her to the, to the cemetery. And then if an ant could speak, if an ant could scream, you could hear the ant say, no, hey guys, I'm very much alive. Listen, I'm kicking and screaming. Don't take me away. And you could see the, the ant uh, kicking, at least. Not screaming, but probably kicking. And then they will take her to the cemetery, and then she will come back. She say, guys, I'm sorry, I'm alive. She will come back to the nest, and then the, the, the ants will say, oh, no, you're very much dead. And then they will grab her again and take over and over again until the oleic acid evaporated. And then they said, oh, oh, you smell like you're alive, so you're welcome back. And then he took the, the experiment to the next level, and then he, uh, he put a little uh, drop of oleic acid in a small paper, just, just a very tiny paper, put it inside the nest, and immediately the ants took the paper out, saying, this paper is dead. Could it be that one of us may be alive physically and yet dead spiritually? We give signs that we do things for the church and worship together in the nest on Saturdays. But it may be, could it be, that one of us may be spiritually dead. Remember that when the Lord uh, comes, he will say to some, 
I do not know you. And we said, but I thought I was spiritually alive and close to you. Luke 13. Luke 13, 27 will tell us the story when he says, I did not know you. Because you were part of the nest. Remember the ant's nest, but in our case, the church. You were part of the nest, but your fragrance, remember the oleic acid? But your fragrance was that of the world. And constantly you were sharing with the world. Because one thing is being in the world, obviously, we're in the world. But another is participating with the world. I would like you to please open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 16. And did you know that Paul tells us the story about the oleic acid? Oh, well, it doesn't say oleic acid, but it says something similar there. Oh, I think Paul knew about this thing. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 16. Fascinating how Paul helps us to bring all of this together. Again, Second Corinthians 2, 14, 16 says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us captives in Christ's triumphant procession, and uses us to what? Spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Spread the aroma. 15. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. We are the what? The pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. 16. To the one we are an aroma that brings what? Death. And to the other an aroma that brings what? Life. So are you telling me that we can be an influence for good or for not so good? Yes. Are you telling me that our aroma, our influence, our words, our life could be a new influence to others for one or for the other? Absolutely. That's what Paul is saying. One that brings death, the other an aroma that brings life. So not only we need to determine if we are dead or alive ourselves, but we need to determine if we are influencing other people for life or for death. Are you full of the aroma of the world? Am I? Or am I full of the aroma of Christ? This, this brings us to the second point. To determine if we are alive or that, I'm um, sorry, to determine if we're ready for the second coming of Christ. The second point is, we need to determine if we are allowing ourselves to be transformed. And the text for this is found in Romans. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world by be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your life. Transformed. Transformation. There was a young fellow whose name was Hank. He was always mad, and he was always upset, and he was always hurting people. And someone one day came and said, Hank, why are you like that? And he says, uh, I'm sorry, that's the way I am. And they went to the church members and said, why do you think, why is Hank like that? He's always mad and upset and, and, and bitter. And some folk in the congregation say, oh, that's good old Hank. He will never change. And that's a tragedy. 
The Lord expects us to change, to move, to grow, to transform, to, to mature. Transformation. Transformation in the New Testament uses the same word that we use today for metamorphosis. Same, the word that we use when a ugly uh, cattle pillar becomes a beautiful butterfly. Everything that is in between is the metamorphosis. And then Paul tells us, you know what? If we could uh, uh, put our modern thoughts into the mind of Paul, probably he will say, listen, you need to go probably through that process of transformation, probably pr a painful process, but it's part of life. Don't avoid the process, the painful process of transformation. Sometimes it's painful, but don't avoid it. Metamorpho, metamorphosis. First the caterpillar. Then the wings starts forming inside there. Then the legs and then a beautiful butterfly. So one aspect of transformation is to allow ourselves to be transformed. Just ourselves. Another aspect is to be agents of transformation. One, Lord, please transform me. I don't want to stay the way I am. I'm selfish. I'm sometimes greedy. I don't want to stay like, Lord, please transform me. That's one aspect. The second aspect is, Lord, as we walk, as we continue our personal Christian lives, is how can I be an agent of transformation for others? Martin Luther King Referring to this topic says that the Christians need to be more like a thermostat rather than a thermometer. A thermometer simply shows the temperature, doesn't it? But a thermostat property linked to the furnace, it will obviously provide nice heat or uh, cold air as we need it. Thermostat is an agent of change. Thermostat will regulate, will change the temperature. And he says, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, that we as Christians, we should be like the thermostat, being agents of transformation, not simply good Seventh-day Adventists that are a thermostat that means saying, oh, the Lord is coming. That, that's good, that shows the temperature, that, that just shows something. But more than that, we need to be agents of change. We actually need to go and do something. Agents of change. Number three, we need to determine if we have become insensitive to the coming of Christ. I remember we were in Brazil on a mission trip when we heard the news of the tsunami. Was it six years ago? Something like that. And we were shocked. But it seems like every time that there's another tsunami and another earthquake, we are more desensitized and we say, another tsunami. Oh, there is a tsunami that is, oh, uh, another earthquake. Oh, another. It seems that we, as the time pass, we are more desensitized about the end of time signs that the Lord has given us. We hear of wars and famines and hurricanes, and that's becoming more normal. What is the great danger for us today? I would argue that our greatest danger today is insensitivity shown to the proximity of the return of the Lord. Insensitive. Of course, that's what the enemy wants. We have desensitized so much that now when we see big wars and difficulties, it's almost normal. Arthur Arnor Black wrote a book called The Church Faces the Isms. And then he says, he claims, that the most dangerous ism that faces the Christian church today is not atheism, is not Gnosticism, 
is not congregationalism, is not racism, is not uh, classicism, is not social uh, sexism, is not ethnocentrism, is not regionalism, is not nationalism, all of those isms, materialism and uh, uh, scholasticism, etc. Not even postmodernism. But he says, the biggest threat and the most pernicious danger facing the church today, it is one of the isms, it is that of somnambulism. The state of walking while you sleep. So it's not those philosophies the most dangerous. It's the possibility that we may be asleep. Are we dead, asleep, or insensitive to the second coming of Christ? Number four, we need to determine if we have yielded to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the virgins very well known. What happened to the five foolish virgins? What really happened? As a matter of fact, Ellen White tells us that um, uh, how many of the virgins were asleep? Thank you. All of them. So that, that gave me hope. Because sometimes I feel asleep. So you know what, Lord? Not only five were asleep, the ten of them were asleep. But there was a difference, of course. One had a good reservoir of oil, the others didn't. But what went wrong with this, with the five foolish? Ellen G. White has the answer, Christ's Object Lessons, lessons, page 411. She says, the class represented by the foolish virgins have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. Simple. They have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock. Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. They had not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit. So are we allowing, are we yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit? The foolish virgins were informed, but they were not transformed. They were educated by the word. They knew the word, but they were not changed by the word. They were convinced, but they were not converted. They were right doctrinally, but they were not ready spiritually. They were getting ready, but they were not ready. Being correct doctrinally, like the five foolish virgins, will not save anyone. Doctrinal correctness will help us like a train on top of the rails. You need to be on top of the rails. But there's more to it. You need the engine, you need the energy, you need the spirit moving that engine of that life in order for you to get somewhere. But there's good news for us today. It is not too late. There is unlimited amount of oil in heaven for each one of us. It is one thing to be preaching and another thing to be ready. It is one thing to be preaching about the second coming of Christ and another to be ready about the second coming of Christ. So the question that I want us to ask today is, are we heading in the direction, in the in the direction of being ready? I heard the story of this uh, young fellow who uh, this couple they were dating. And then uh, he said, you know what, uh, how about if we go on a date? And she says, oh, no, you know what, come home. Uh, I'll fix something to eat for us. Come home, and uh, I'll fix a nice meal for the two of us. So, sure, what time? Seven. Deal. 7 p.m. 
She put her best dress, best perfume, put her hair up, and all oh, this, you know, house was impeccable. Whole house was smelling great. She was getting ready. And actually, there was a moment when she was actually ready. So 7 p.m., the boyfriend, 7 p.m. didn't come, but, uh, you know, some of us are kind of late, you know, perennial late, you know. So she said, oh, he's, he's always late, like 10, 15 minutes. So hey, he will come. So 7.15 came, boyfriend didn't come. 7.30, didn't come, she started to get worried. 7.45, didn't show up. He called, no answer. 8 o'clock, he didn't show up. She was discouraged. This guy stood me up. I don't know, but this is not right. He forgot. 8.30 came, nothing. So 8.30, she said, forget it, he's not coming. So she ate, <laughs> she, she ate, yeah, and... Uh, she grabbed a popcorn, she went upstairs, let the, her, her hair down, put her pajamas. And, um, and okay, so she was watching some TV. So at 9 p.m., she heard the door. Uh, okay, so she came, opened the door, it was her boyfriend. And before she was able to say anything, the boyfriend looked at her, he saw her in pajamas with her hair down, and he says, sweetie, I'm late two hours and you're still not ready. <laughs> and then, of course, we smile, but something similar happened to the five foolish virgins. They were ready at one moment, they let, but then they let their guard down. Could it be that at times we, that love the second coming of Christ, could let our guard down? Perhaps become discouraged because the Lord is taking long. And the Lord says, you know what? The reason I'm taking long is because I do not want anybody to perish. But don't get discouraged because I'm coming. I'm coming. So in summary, we need to determine, number one, if we are shedding the aroma of the world or the aroma of Christ to the world. Number two, do we allow the Lord to make a metamorphosis, a change in our lives? Are we allowing the Lord to change our lives? Number three, are we sensitive to the coming of Christ or the signs of the times? Number four, are we surrendered to the work of the Holy Spirit? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to take full control of our lives? Do we love the second coming of Christ? As it was read earlier in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but also to those that love his appearing. Every time that we go and do evangelism in another country, we ask a group of Bible workers to go before us and prepare the field for the harvest, if you please. And some years ago, uh, the first time that we went to Cuba, we asked a, f a number of Bible workers to do the same. And one of them, one of the Bible workers, went to the streets of Havana. Actually, the red district. <laughs> well, excuse me? Yeah. The red district. And, um, and he found a young lady there that uh, worked in the red district. And uh, he said, young lady, I, I think the Lord has something better for you. And, and I would like to share it with you. And he was surprised that she didn't chase him away. But uh, when he says, here's a pamphlet, I'll come back tomorrow. And if you would love to study the Bible with me, I, I would love to study with you. And she didn't say much. She says, whatever. And then he left and then came back the next day. And he was surprised that she was there and she didn't hide or anything. And he says, so can we go to, to a park and study a little bit about the, the word? And she came. And when we arrived to Cuba, uh, the Bible worker came and said, Pastor Ortiz, 
I want to introduce you to, to one young lady I've been studying the Bible with. And he told me the background, among others, drug dealer and prostitution, etc. And, uh, and I met her, and uh, I, her name is Liusmila. And I said, Liusmila, we're so glad to have you here. I would really love to have you here the whole week, because that was the first day of, the, of uh, evangelistic meetings. And she says, I'll, I'll do my best to come. And night after night, she was there in the corner, in the bed. She sat in the last bench. And we were praying for her and for, for other visitors. And we were there for a week. And at the, end, uh, at the end of the week, I made an altar call for people to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Whoever wants to surrender their lives to him, to come forward. And Yusmila was one of them. And she was coming down the aisle, bawling. And then she came, and I came, and I gave her a hug, and I said, Lyusmila, praise the Lord. And she whispered to me in my ear, and she said, Pastor Ortiz, I know you guys are leaving to the States tomorrow, Sunday. Would you please baptize me? I would like you to baptize me, and could you do that? And fortunately, she had been studying with a Bible worker. She just needed this last Push, if you please. And she was, she was ready and said, of course, I would love to, to baptize you. And that Saturday, I don't know if her coat or my coat was uh, wet because of the splash here on top or because of her tears. Lius Mila, a person that lived in the streets for years, selling her body, and now... Through the blood of Jesus, she was a new person. She was transformed. And she said, Pastor, this is going to be tough. Because people know where I live. I'm a drug dealer. And I told her, Luz Mila, I don't know what you're going to do, but the Lord is going to give you the strength. One year later, we went back to Havana. And I took the, the, the students that came with me and I said, hey guys, let's go back to Luz Mila's house. Actually, it was not a house. It was a shanty house in the one of the most dangerous places in Cuba. Actually, it was not even a shanty house. It was pieces of, of sink that she was able to put there with some two by fours and small. You had to enter. Uh, uh, you could not stand there because it was so low. So I knocked at the door. This was one year later. And who is it? And I said, I, I wanted to give her the, the surprise. Uh, you know, missionaries are friends, your friends. But I said, just open the door. And she said, nope, you need to identify yourself. <laughs> okay. I said, okay, this is Pastor Ortiz. And she came and she hugged us. And I said, Luz Mila, I just want to know what has happened during this past year? Have you remained faithful to Jesus Christ? Remember that commitment one year ago? And she said, Pastor Ortiz, by the grace of God, the Lord has helped me. And I said, how, how? Just tell me, how has this happened? And then she said, listen, it actually was simple. People would come to my house, knocked at the door, looking for drugs or whatever. And then I said, who is it? And then people will identify themselves. And then she says, Luz Mila is dead. <laughs> and they said, uh, uh, excuse me, in this shanty house only one person lives, and that voice is kind of similar. So how does this work? I think you are Luz Mila. And she said, no, you're wrong. Luz Mila is dead. Please go away. And, and she said, the clients would start going away one by one, and it actually was somehow simple because uh, they said, okay, I guess she's dead. And now she said, I'm dating a wonderful seven-day Adventist young fellow and we're planning to get married. Amen. Transformation. And Luzmila uh, made now that place that used to be a place of drug dealing, etc. Now a sanctuary and a light for Jesus Christ in her community. Amen. Because one day, somebody 
had the guts to go and say, I think the Lord has something better for you. And that's why today I would like to appeal to what I said earlier. Would you like to uh, perhaps think, could it be that we can help one or two Bible workers there in Cuba? At the end, uh, our deacons will have a special play offer, uh, offering plate for you to say, you know what? I would like to do the same, sponsor that Bible worker with a bicycle so he or she can go and preach the gospel and many other lusmilases can learn about Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord help us to be ready for the second coming of Christ. May we not be fooled in saying everything is well, I'm okay. But put your hand in your heart and say, am I, being, uh, am I allowing myself to be transformed? Am I allowing the Holy Spirit to break my life, my heart, to guide me in everything I do? Am I analyzing if I'm dead or alive? Let's pray. Precious Lord, as we think about the second coming of Christ, we know that it is so important that we even have it in our name in every fiber of our writings is the Adventist. The Adventism, the Advent message. But Lord, perhaps we have become so used to it that we uh, at times are not ready for that moment. Could it be that because I love you, because I can't wait for your coming, I want to be ready for the right reasons because I love you, because I can't wait to see you, because I can't wait to live with you for an eternity. So Lord, help us to analyze ourselves and make sure that we're heading in the right direction. Thank you for this wonderful church. Please bless uh, the pastor, the elders, the leaders, and continue blessing them to bless this community in such a mighty way. For we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.